Huzzah, folks, and welcome back to Daggerfall Unity. Let's wrap up the real Baron Zaya, shall we, with part nine. As, as Seamus predict, had predicted, the theft of the Staff of Chaos had few short-term consequences. The current Emperor, Uriel Septim, sent some rather stiff messages expressing shock and displeasure at the Staff's disappearance, and urging that Seamus make every effort to locate its whereabouts and, communi and communicate this with the newly appointed Imperial Battle Mage, Gagar Tharn, in whose hands the matter has been placed. Ugh. Can you imagine if the Nightingale ended up becoming Jaegar Tharn, and then he has both the Horn and the Staff? Maybe that's actually what happened. Tharn! Seamus snarled in disgust and frustration. He was paced about the small chamber where Baron Zaya, now some months pregnant, was sitting sternly, knitting a baby's blanket. Jaegar Tharn, indeed! I wouldn't give him directions for any crossing of the street! What have you against this person, husband? I just don't trust the mongrel elf. Part wood elf, part dark elf, and part only the god no gods know what. Hey, part dark elf. All the worst qualities of, of all his combined races. <laughs> None knows much about him. Claims he was born in Valenwood of a wood elf mother. Seems to have been everywhere since. Baron Zaya sunk in the content, uh, contentment of preg pregnancy hadn't only been humoring Seamus thus far, but this piqued her interest. Nightingale? Could he have been Jaegar Tharn disguised? Nay, human blood seems to be the one missing component in Tharn's ancestry. Could be hiding it. To Seamus, Baron Zaya knew that was a, uh, that was a flaw. Yeah, it's kind of obvious, right? Seamus uh, despised wood elves as lazy thieves and high elves as effet intellectuals, but he admired humans, especially Bretons, for their combination of pragmatism, intelligence, and energy. Oh, you hear that, Jacobius? Yeah. Uh, night <laughs> Nightingale <laughs> Nightingales of Ebonheart of the House Mora, and uh, I'll be bound. That house has had human blood ever since her time. Ebonheart was jealous of that staff, uh, that the staff was laid here when Tiber Septum took the horn from us. Baron Zaya sighed a little. The rivalry between Edmund Hart and Mornhold reached back almost to the dawn of history. Once the two had been one, all the minds within held uh, by clan, oh god, Ra Rathim, Rathim, <laughs> whose royal house held the high kingship of Morrowind. Ebonheart had split into two separate city-states, Ebonheart and Mornhold, when Queen Lane's twin sons, Morlan, uh, Morlan's grandsons, had been left as the heirs at the same time the office of High King had been vacated in favor of a temporary war leader to be named by the council in times of provincial, uh, provincial emergency. Still, Ebonheart remained jealous of her prerogatives as the eldest city-state of Morrowind. Still first among equals and the claim that the guardianship of the Horn should rightfully be entrusted to the Elder, Mortenhold responded that Morlan himself had placed the Horn in the keeping of the god Effin, and Mortenhold was unarguably the god's birthplace. Why not tell Jaegar Tharn of your suspicion, then? Let him recover the thing. As long as it's safe, what does it matter where it lies? Seamus, uh, Seamus stared at her without comprehension. It matters, he said softly. Oh, it, it matters, he says softly. But not that much, he added. Certainly not enough for you to concern yourself further over it. You just tend to your knitting. In a few more months, Baron Zaya produced a fine son whom they named Helseth. Ah, oh, I fucking met him. And killed him in Morrowind. <laughs> Nothing more was heard of the staff or Nightingale. If Ebonheart held it, certainly there did not, uh, they did not boast of it. The years passed swiftly and happily. Helseth grew tall and strong. He was much like his father, whom he worshipped. 
When Helseth was eight years old, old Baron Zaya bore a second child, <laughs> a daughter to Seamus' great delight. Helseth was his pride, yet little Morga uh, Morgaya held his heart. Hey, we met her. Nice. Actually, we arranged her wedding. Wow. Time flies? I guess. Shortly after Morgaya, uh, Morgaya's birth, word came that a plot against the Emperor had been unmasked and that the chief conspirators, Yeyar Tharn and Rhea Silmain, were dead. Wow. Seamus rejoiced at this news. <laughs> I told you so, he said. He, cr he crowed. Yet thereafter, relations with the Empire slowly deteriorated for no apparent reason. Taxes were raised and quotas increased with each passing year. Seamus felt that the Emperor suspected him of having a bad hand in the plot and sought to prove his loyalty by making every effort to comply with the increasing demands. He lengthened working hours and raised taxes, and even made up some of the difference for some uh, from both crown funds and their own private holdings. Yet still, he demand the demands increased, and commoners and nobles alike grew restless. Well, that's why they're fucking feuding and morrowing, Jesus Christ. I want you to take the children and journey yourself to the Imperial City, Seamus said at last in desperation. You must make the Emperor listen, else all Mournhold will revolt come spring. You have a way with men. You always did, he forced a smile. Baron Zaya forced a smile of her own. Even you. Yes, even me, he said dully. Both children, Baron Zaya looked towards the corner windows where Helseth was strumming a lute and singing a duet with his little sister. Helseth was fifteen, Morgaya just eight. Perhaps they'll soften his heart. Besides, it's time that Helseth was presented at Imperial at the Imperial Court. Perhaps, but that's not just uh, that's not your true reason. You do not think you can keep them safe here. If that's the case, then you're not safe here either. Come with us, Baron Zaya urged. He took her hands in his. Baron Zaya, love, heart of my heart, if I leave now, there'll be nothing for us to return to. I'll be all right. I can take care of myself, and I can do better if we need not fear for you and the children. Baron Zaya laid her head against his chest. Just remember that we need you. We can do without the rest if we have each other. Empty hands and empty bellies are easier to bear than an empty heart. My foolishness has brought us uh, brought this to pass. If so, tis not so a place to be. His eyes rested fondly on their carefree children, and none of this shall go without. I cost you everything, once Baron Zaya, and I, Tiber, uh, I and Tiber Septim. Without my aid, the Septim dynasty would never have begun. I helped its rise. I can bring about its fall. You may tell Uriel Septim that, and my patience is bounded. <laughs> oh my god, my hair stood on end with that statement. Um, Baron Zaya gasped. Seamus was not given to empty threats, so no more imagined that he would ever turn against the Empire, that the old house wolf lying by the hearth would turn on her. <laughs> How, she demanded, but he shook his head. Better that you not know. He said, just tell him that if he prove uh, recliant, recliant, I've never seen that word either. And I do not fear. He's septum enough that he will not kill the messengers. The late winter journey to the Imperial City was an easy one. One of the things the Septum Empire had accomplished was building in the maintenance of good highways through Tamriel, just like the Romans. I think that's what they're based off of, right? Um, Baron Zaya stood before the Emperor's throne, explaining Mournhold's straits, and she waited weeks for an audience with Uriel Septim. Fobbed off on pretext or another, His Excellency is indisposed. An urgent matter demands his attention. I am sorry, Your Highness. There must be some mistake. Your appointment is for next week. No, see? And now it was not going well. He did not even seem to be listening to her. 
He hadn't invited her to sit, nor had he missed the ch dismissed the children. Helsa stood still and carved, uh, stood still as he as a carved statue. But little Morgaya began to fidget. He had greeted the three of them with a too bright smile of welcome that did not reach his eyes. Ugh. Then she presented her children. She had gazed at them. Uh, he had ga he gazed at them with fi with fixed attention, that was real yet inappropriate. Ugh. Baron Zaya had been dealing with humans for nearly five hundred years now, and had developed a skill at reading their expressions and move uh, and movement that was far beyond uh, that of any human uh, human ever learned. Jesus. <sighs> Try as the Emperor might to conceal it, there was a hunger in his eyes and something more. Regret? Why? He had several fine children of his own. Why covet hers? And why look at her with an intense, though brief, yearning? Ah, well, perhaps he was tired of his lady. Humans were fickle-minded, but after that one long burning glance, his eye had shifted away as she began to speak of her mission and he sat still as a stone. Puzzled, Baron Zaya stared into the pale, set face, looking for some trace of the septum she had known. She hadn't known Uriel Septum well, having met on him only once when he was still a child and then at the coronation twenty years before. Uh, he'd been stern and dignified then, yet not icily remote as this man was. Despite the physical resemblance, he did seem to be of the same. Uh, didn't seem to be the same man at all. Not the same. Yet something about him was familiar to her, more familiar than it should be. Some trick of posture or gesture. Suddenly, she felt very warm, as if lava had been poured over her. Illusion. She had studied well the arts of illusion since Nightingale had fooled her so badly. She had learned to detect it, and she felt it now. And certainly, a blind man could feel the sun on his face. Oh, man. Illusion? But why? Her mind worked furiously, even as her mouth went on reciting details of the mournhold economy. Vanity? Humans were oft as ashamed of their signs of age as elves are proud of them. Yet the face Uriel Septim wore seemed consistent with, uh, consistent with his age. Baron Zaya dared use no, uh, dared use none of her magic arts even petty nobles had means of detecting if not shielding themselves uh, from these in their halls the use of magic here would bring down his wrath as surely as drawing a knife would magic illusion suddenly she thought of nightingale and briefly he sat before her only saddened trapped and then uh, and then the blah, 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 trapped and then that vision faded and another man sat there, like Nightingale and yet unlike, pale-skinned, red-eyed, and elven ears, uh, and, about, around, and about him a fierce glow of concentration, an aura of energy, a, a shining horror, a shrinking horror. This man was capable of anything, and then, once again, he beheld the face of Uriel Septum. Now could she be sure? Uh, how could she be sure she wasn't imagining things? Perhaps her mind was playing tricks on her. She felt a sudden, vast weariness, as if she had become carrying a heavy burden for far too long. That's a fucking sign that she detected strange magics. Do you remember, Excellency? Seamus uh, and I had dinner with your family shortly after your father's coronation. You are no older than little Morgaya here. We were greatly honored to be the only guests that evening, except for your best friend Justin, of course. Ah, yes, the Emperor said. I believe I do recall that. You and Justin were such friends. I was told he died not long after. A great pity. Indeed, I still, not, I still do not like to speak of him. His eyes were wary. Ah, as for your request, my lady... We shall take it under advisement and, le and let you know. There was no Justin. Come on. Come on. Come on. Baron Zaya bowed, as did her children. A nod dissed them, uh, dissed them, dismissed them, and they backed away from the presence. 
Baron Zaya took a deep breath, Justin had been an imaginary friend. Although Uriel had insisted that a place be set for Justin at every meal, not only that, Justin had been a girl, despite the boy name. Seamus had kept up with the family joke long after that. Justin had gone whichever, uh, where, wherever such childhood friends go, inquiring seriously after Justin's well-being whenever he and Uriel Septim met and being responded to as seriously. The lady Baron Zaya had heard, the last Baron Zaya had heard, Justin, after, <laughs> after an adventurous youth, had married a high elf and settled in Lilindil, Lilindril. The man accompanying the Emperor's chair was not Uriel Septim, Nightingale. A chord of recognition rang through her, and Baron Zaya knew she was right. It was he indeed. Seamus had been wrong. So wrong. What now, she wondered. What had become of Uriel Septim? And more to the point, what did it mean for her and Seamus and Mournhold? Thinking back, Baron Zaya guessed that her, uh, their troubles were due to this false emperor, Nightingale, or whoever he really was. He must have taken Uriel Septim's place shortly before the unreasonable demands of Mournhold had begun. That would explain why relations had deteriorated so long as humans judged time. After her offense, Nightingale knew of Seamus' famed loyalty to and knowledge of the Septims and was making a preemptive strike. If that were indeed the case, they were all in terrible danger. She and the children were under his hand here in the Imperial City, and Seamus left alone to face the troubles of Nightingale's brewing. What must she do? Baron Zaya urged the children ahead of her, a hand on each shoulder, her woman servant and guards trailing behind. They had reached their waiting carriage, even though their apartment was only a few blocks from the palace. Royal dignity forbade their walking, and for once Baron Zaya was glad of that. Even the carriage seemed kind of a sanctuary now, false as she knew the feeling would be. A boy dashed up to, uh, up to one of the guards and handed him a letter then pointed towards the carriage. The guard brought it to her. The boy waited, eyes wide. The letter was br uh, brief and complimentary, and simply asked if King Edwyr of Wayrest, High Rock, might be granted an audience with her, as he had heard much of her, and would be pleased to make her acquaintance. Oh. Baron Zaya's first impulse was to refuse. She wanted only to leave the si this city, Certainly, she had no inclination for any dalancies <laughs> uh, with a dazzling, with a da dazzled human. She looked up, frowning, and one of the guards said, The boy says his master awaits your reply yonder. She looked in the direction indicated and saw a handsome elderly man with ho on horseback surrounded by half-dozen courtiers uh, and guards. He caught her eye and bowed respectively, removing his plumed hat. Wow! So this is how her and her current husband, uh, their love, started blooming. The Real Byron's Eye, Part 10. I'm going to take another sippy poo of beer. Ah! Stretch all my muscles and my arms. Pop my back. Baron Zaya stood at the open tower window. Waiting, she could sense her familiar uh, her familiar's at nearness, but through the night sky was clear as day. To her eyes, she could not uh, yet see him. Then suddenly, he was there. A swift moving dot beneath the wispy night clouds. A few more minutes and the great night hawk was there. Wings folded, talons reaching for her thick leather armband. She carried the bird to its perch where it waited, patting, uh, panting? Okay, panting while her, oh yeah, I guess. Uh, where it waited, panting while her impatient fingers felt for the message secured in a capsule on one leg. It drank, then ruffled its feathers and began to preen secure it in her presence a tiny part of her consciousness shared its satisfaction with a job well done 
uh, rest earned, yet beneath that was an, an unease. Things were not right, even in the bird's mind. Her fingers shook as she unfolded the shin, uh, thin sheet and poured over the sheet of cramped writing, not Seamus' bold hand. Baron Zaya sat slowly, fingers smoothing the document while she prepared in her mind and body to access, uh, accept cal uh, disaster calmly. The Imperial Guards had deserted Seamus and joined the rebels. The loyal troops had suffered a decisive defeat. Oh no. The rebel leader had, began, uh, had been recognized as King of Morrowind by the Emperor. Seamus was dead. No! Baron Zaya and the children had been declared traitors of the Emperor Empire and the price had been set on their heads. My lady, Baron Zaya jumped startled of the servant's approach. The Breton is here, King Edwir. The woman added hopefully, noting Baron Zaya's puzzlement. Is there news, my lady? she said, nodding at the Nighthawk. Nothing that will not wait, Baron Zaya said quite quickly. See to the bird. King Edwir greeted uh, her graven her gravely and uh, greeted her gravely and courteously, if rather rather fulsomely. <laughs> Uh, he claimed to be a great admirer of Seamus, who figured prominently in his family legends. Gradually, he turned the conversation to near business with the Emperor. Finding her non-committal, he suddenly blurted out, My lady queen, you must believe me, the man po posing as the Emperor is an imposter. I know it sounds mad, but I know, Baron Saya said with a sudden decisiveness, you are correct, I know. Edwir relaxed, relaxed back in his seat, and for the first time, eyes shrewd. You know, you're not just humoring a madman. My lady, I, we need your aid. Baron Saya grimmed, uh, smiled grimly at the irony of what insistence must, must uh, <laughs> of what assistance might I be, my lord. Quickly, he outlined a plot. The Imperial Sorceress Ri Shalim had been killed and declared a traitor by the False Emperor, yet she retained a bit of her power and could yet contact a few of those she had known well on her mortal plane. She had chosen a champion uh, who, would undertake, uh, who would undertake to assemble the missing staff pieces and use the staff's power to destroy Yegar Tharn, who was otherwise invulnerable and rescue and rescue the true emperor who was being held prisoner in another plane however the chosen champion languished now in the imperial dungeons Tharn's attention must be diverted while he freed himself uh, with it with Rhea's help Rhea's help Rhea's help Baron Zaya had Tharn's ear and I uh, Baron Zaya had Tharn's ear and I could she provide the necessary distraction? I suppose I could obtain another audience with him. Would that be sufficient? What do you mean, his eye? Edward looked uncomfortable. It was whispered among the servants that Jaegar Tharn kept your likeness in a sort of shrine in his chambers. What? That surprises you? Yes and no. Our chosen one may need a few days to escape. You trust me in this? Why? We are desperate, my lady. We have no choice. But yes, I do trust you. Seamus is dead, Baron Zaya explained quickly and coolly. My lady, what dreadful news. For the first time, Edmer, uh, Edwir's, Edwir's urbane poise was shaken. Under the circumstances, we can hardly ask. Nay, my lord king. Under the circumstances, I must do what I may to avenge myself upon the murderer of my children's father. In return, I ask only that you protect my orphan children as you may. Most willingly do I pledge, most brave and noble lady. Old fool, Baron Zaya thought. She did not sleep that night, but sat in a chair beside her bed, hands folded in her lap, thinking long, deep thoughts. She would not tell the children, not yet, not until she must. She had no need to seek another audience with the Emperor, for a summons came in the morning. She told the children she expected to be gone a few days, bade them give the servants no trouble, and kissed them goodbye. 
Morgaya whimpered a lot, for she was bored and lonely in the Imperial City. Helsith looked door but said nothing. I don't know what that word means. He was very like his father. At the palace, Baron Zaya was escorted not into the Great Hall, but into a small parlor where the Emperor sat at a solitary uh, sat at a solitary breakfast. He nodded in greeting and waved his hand to the window. Splendid view, isn't it? Baron Zaya stared out over the towers of the great city. It dawned on her that this was the very chamber where she had first met Tiber Septim, and a strong wave of in coherent feelings swept over her? Inchoate feelings? When she turned back, at last, Uriel Septim had vanished and Nightingale sat in his place, laughing. He knew. You knew, he said accusingly, scanning her face. I wanted to surprise you. You might at least be uh, pretend. Baron Zaya spread her arms. I'm afraid my skills at pretense are no match for yours, my liege. You're angry with me, he pretended to pout. Just a little, she said icily. I do find betrayal offensive. How human of you. What do you want of me? He wiped his mouth and stood erect. Now you are pretending. You know what I want of you, my love. You want to tantalize and torment me. Go ahead. I am in your power. No, no, no. I don't want all that, Baron Zaya. He came near, speaking low in the old caressing voice that sent shivers over her body. Don't you see? This is the this was the only way. His hands closed on her arms. You could have taken me with you. Tears gathered in her eyes. He shook his head. I didn't have the power. Ah, but now, now I have it all. Mine to have, mine to share with you. He waved his hand towards the window and the city beyond all Tamriel to lay at your feet. And that is only the beginning. It's too late. Too late. You left me to, uh, to him. He's dead a scant few years. What does it make? Uh, what does it matter? The children, I'll adopt them. We'll have others together, Baron Zaya. I have powers you do not dream of. He moved to kiss her, but she, she slipped from his grasp and turned away. I don't believe you. You do know. You're still angry, that's all. His smile did not reach his eyes. Ah, another interesting, interesting uh, sentence right there. What do you want? She shrugged. A walk in the garden? A song or two? Ah, you want to be courted. Why not? You do it so well. It's been long since I have had pleasure. And so they spent their days in courtship, walking, talking, singing, laughing together, while the emperor, emperor, Empire's business was left to underlings. Oh no. I like to see the staff, Baron Zaya said idly one day. I only had a glimpse of it. Nothing would give me greater pleasure. Heart's delight, but that's impossible. You don't trust me, Baron Zaya pouted as she softened her lips for his kiss. Nonsense, love. It isn't here. In fact, it isn't anywhere. He laughed and kissed her again softly. Now you're talking riddles again. I want to see it. You can't. You couldn't. You can't have destroyed it. Ah, you've gained in wisdom since last we met. You piqued my interest somewhat. The staff can't be destroyed, and it can't be removed from Tamriel, not without the direst of consequences to the land itself. Ah, all true, and yet, as I said, it isn't anywhere. Can you solve the riddle? It isn't anywhere? Then it's elsewhere? Maybe? He pulled her to him, and she leaned into his embrace. He's, uh, here, here's a greater, greater riddle still, he whispered. How to make one of two that I can and will show you. Their bodies merged, limbs tangled together. Later, when they'd uh, drawn a bit apart and dozed, she thought sleepily, one of two, two of one, three of two. What cannot be destroyed or banished might be split apart, perhaps. Ah. Nightingale kept a diary. He scribed entries in it each night after quick reports from his underlings. It was locked, but the lock was a simple one. 
<laughs> so Baron Zaya managed to sneak a quick peek, uh, quick looks at it while he was occupied. In... Are you serious? Toileting himself? Wow, okay. Taking shit. <laughs> it's like adding, having like the word password on your fucking computer as your password. Uh, she discovered that the first staff piece was hidden in an ancient dwarven mine called Fang Lair. Although its location was given only in vague terms, the diary was crammed with jotted events in an odd a shorthand that was very hard to decipher. All of Tamriel, she thought, in his hands and mine and more, perhaps, and yet, for all his surface charm, there was a cold emptiness where his heart should have been. An emptiness of which he was quite unaware, she thought. One could glimpse it now and then, when his eyes would go blank and hard. Peasant dreams, Baron Zaya thought, and straw flashed back before her eyes, looking sad, and then Theris, with a mocking smile and an empty eye sockets, Seamus, who did what must be done, quietly and effectively, efficiently. I thought I heard something fall, but nothing's back there. Uh, Nightingale, Nightingale, who would rule them all. More and yet spread chaos in the name of control. Baron Zaya got reluctant, uh, reluctant leave from Nightingale to go to her children, who had to be told of their father's death and of the Emperor's offer of his protection to them. Edwir called on them while she was there, and she told him that she had discovered so far, and explained that she must remain a while yet and learn more as she could. Nightingale teased her, teased uh, what? Teased her about her elderly admirer. Uh, he was quite aware of Edwir's suspicion, although, as he said, no one took the old fool seriously. Baron Zaya managed to arrange a reconciliation of sorts between them. Edwir publicly recanting his suspicion, and uh, his old friend forgave him. <laughs> Thus, uh, he was invited to dine with them at least once a week. The children liked Edwir, even Helseth, who disapproved of his mother's liaison with the Emperor, and consequently detested Nightingale. Helseth understood Nightingale? Uh, he had become surely, uh, surly and temperamental and frequently quarreled with both of them. Ugh, that's not good. Oh, it's almost over. Edwir was not happy, uh, was not happy either and, uh, either. And Nightingale delighted in publicly displaying his affection for Baron Zaya. They could not marry, of course, for Uriel Septim was already married. He had exiled the true Empress shortly after taking Septim's place, oh my god, but had not dared harm her. She was held by the Temple of the One. It, was, uh, it had been given out publicly that she was in ill health and rumors had been circulating that she had mental problems. I don't think any of that would be true. The Emperor's children had also been dispatched to various prisons disguised as schools. <laughs> wow. She'll grow worse in time, Nightingale said care uh, carelessly, eyeing Baron Zaya's swollen breasts and belly with satisfaction. As for his children, well, life is full of hazards, isn't it? We'll be married. Your child will be my true heir. He did want the, uh, he did want the child. Baron Zaya was sure of that. She was far less sure of his feelings for her. They quarreled, often violently, usually about Helseth, whom he wanted to send away to school. <laughs> Baron Zaya made no effort to avoid these quarrels. Nightingale had no interest in a peaceful life and had thoroughly enjoyed making up afterwards. I mean, make up sex, probably. Occasionally, Baron Zaya would uh, take the children and retreat to, their old retreat to their old apartment, declaring she wanted no more to do with him. Oh, boy. She was six months pregnant before she finally deciphered the location of the last st staff piece. Damn, it took that long? An easy one, since the since every Dark Elf knew where Dagoth Ur was. Uh, next, uh, she quarreled with Nightingale and simply left the city with Edwir, and they rode hard for High Rock and Wayrest. Nightingale was furious, but there was little he could do. His assassins were rather inept, and he dared not leave his seat of power to pursue them in person. Nor could he openly declare war on Wayrest. He had no legitimate claim on her, 
unborn child, and the nobility had disapproved of his liaison with Varenziah and were glad that she was gone. Wayrest was equally disapproving uh, and distrustful of her, but Edwir was much beloved by his prosperous little city. Uh, okay, yeah. He was, he's a loved king. And allowances were readily made for his uh, incentricacies, I think. Damn. Well, that's how Baron Zaya got to Wayrest in the end. From birth to Wayrest. What a fucking story. I can't believe that. That's insane. Well, should we check out this one? <laughs> Whoa. This is short. Hang on. That's the dubious. That's three. This is two. That's short, too. Oh my god, that's just one paragraph? Asshole. <laughs> well, I think this will just be a long episode. Let's read all of these. Let's let's finish this out. Let's let's finish this out like we were saying. Biography of Queen Berenziah, Volume 1, by Stem Gambage. And if I recall correctly, that's, he's a historical writer for the Imperial City. The first volume of this series, series told by the story of Baron Zaya's origin, heiress of the throne of Mornhold, until her father king rebelled against the excellency, his excellency, Tiber Septim, and brought ruin to the province of Morrowind. Due to the benevolence of the emperor, the child Baron Zaya was not destroyed with her parents, but reared by a baron by the Baron Sven at, of Blackmoor. She grew beautiful, pious, and trusting in his care. His trust was exploited by a wicked orphan stable boy at Baron Sven's estate, uh, who with lies tricked her into fleeing Blackmoor with him. After many adventures on the road, they settled in Riften, uh, a Skyrim city on the border of Marwen. They didn't even... Oh, okay, so they are talking about Straw. I thought they didn't name him. The stable boy Straw was not altogether evil. He did love Baron Zaya in his own selfish fashion. <laughs> and, and the lie was that the only way he could think of uh, and the lie was the only way he could think of that might uh, so that he might have her. She, of course, felt only friendship for him, but was hopeful that she would change her mind. He wanted to buy a small farm and settle down in marriage, but the earnings were barely enough to feed and shelter them. <laughs> what the fuck? Okay. This is a little bit more detailed than I was expecting. After only a short time in Riften, Straw fell fell with a bold villain. Oh, Straw fell with a bold villain of a Khajiit named a thief named Theris, who prosper who proposed that they rob the Imperial Cam uh, Commandant's house. Theris said that he had a client, a traitor to the Empire, who would pay well for the information that they would find there. Baron Zaya happened to overhear this plan and was appalled. <laughs> oh my god, this is the lie then. She stole from their rooms, uh, from their rooms and walked the streets of Ripton in desperation, torn between loyalty to the Emperor and to her friend. In the end, loyalty to the Empire prevailed over the personal friendship, and she approached the Commandant's office, revealing her true identity, and warned him of her friend's plan. Uh, the Commandant listened to her tale, praised her courage, and assured her that no harm would come to her. General Seamus had been scouring the countryside in search of her since the disappearance, and had arrived in Rift and hot in pursuit. I mean, that's not how it was told in the other one. Uh, he took her into custody and informed her that far from being sold, uh, far from being sold, she was to be instated as queen. Okay, she was to be queen of Mornhold as soon as she turned 18. Until that time, she was to live with the Imperial family in the new Imperial city, where she would learn some time, uh, something of Imperial governance and make an acquaintance of the people of importance. And so it came to pass, in the Imperial City, Baron Zaya became great friends with Tiber Septim during the last years of his reign. Tiber's heir, Pelagius, also came to love her as a sister. I don't know if that's true. The ballards of the day praised her beauty, chastity, wit, and learning. <laughs> chastity. Uh, on her 18th birthday, the entire Imperial City turned out to watch her procession back to Mournhold. 
sorrowful as they were for her departure, departure, all knew that she was ready to be uh, the glorious sovereign of the newly of the new kingdom of Mournhold. Very abridged. I mean, that's you can't get more abridged than that. And this one is just as bad. The first volume of this of this series told the story of Baron Zaya's origin heiress of the throne of Mournhold, until her father king rebelled against his and the Excellency. Wait. Did I read that one? I need to read volume two. Use. Wait a minute. Use. Did I not read the right one? Wait, what? Okay, I guess I read the wrong one. I think I read two first. Uh, in the late second er era, an heir, a girl child, Baron Zaya, was born into the rulers of Mournhold. Uh, in uh, of, of rulers of Mournhold and Marwin. Ugh, I'm getting all tongue-tied. I've read too much tonight. She was reared in a small luxury and securities befitted a royal dark elf child until she reached five years of age. At that time, His Excellency, Tiber Septim, demanded that the descendant rulers of Morrowind yield to him and institute imperial reforms, trusting to their vaunted magic and imprudently refused, uh, refused and much of Morrowind was laid to waste in the conflict that ensured, ensued. The little princess Baron Zaya and her nurse were found among the wreckage, General Seamus himself, a dark elf and born in Mournhold, suggested to his excellency that the child might someday be valuable, and she was placed with a royal support, uh, a loyal supporter who had recently retired from the Imperial Army. Oh, so that's Sven's backstory. On retirement, Sven Averson had been made Baron of Blackmoor, a small town in the central in central Skyrim. Baron Sven and his wife reared her as her own daughter, saw, it, uh, saw to it that she was educated properly, and more importantly, was taught the imperial virtues and piety. In short, she was made fit to take her place as a member of the new ruling class of Morrowind. The young girl Baron Zaya grew in beauty, grace, and intelligence. She was very sweet-tempered, a joy to, to her adoptive parents and their five young sons, who loved her as their elder sister. <laughs> I don't think any of that's true. Other than her appearance, she differed from young girls of her class only that she had a young, a strong epiphany, empathy, for the woods and fields and was wont to escape her household duties to wander there. Baron Zaya was happy and content until her 16th year when a wicked orphan stable boy whom she had befriended out of pity told her that he had overheard a conspiracy of her dear guardian. Baron Sven said that the boy had dealt with a Redguard visitor to sell her to a concubine in Rihad. Uh, as no Nord or Breton would marry her on account of her black skin, and no Dark Elf would have her because of her foreign upbringing. The fuck? Uh, whatever shall I do, the poor girl wept trembling, for she had brought up in innocence and trust, and never incurred to her that her friend would lie to her. The wicked boy, who was called Straw, jeez, here we go, said she must run away if she valued her virtue. But he would come with her and protect her. Sorrowfully, Baron Zaya agreed to this plan. And that very night, Baron Zaya disguised herself as a boy and the pair escaped to the nearby city of Whiterun. After a few days there, they managed to get places uh, as guards in a disreputable merchant caravan. The caravan was headed east by side roads in dishonest attempt to elude lawful tolls charged on the highway. Thus, they eluded pursuit until they reached the city of Riften, where they ceased their travels. They felt safe in Riften, close as they were to Morrowind border, so dark elves uh, were commonly seen. The story of how Baron Zaya finally became to throne in Mournhold in this fit fitful start is told in Volume 2 of the biography of Queen Baron Zaya, and it indeed is. So let's go... Wait, yeah. Nothing about the... 
the sex or anything. Yeah. So now we need to read three. And this one's... I remember this one, too, in Mar when I was playing Morrowind. It was one all fucking mess like this. It's such a mess. And, like, the formatting was all fucked up here, too. It's kind of weird. It's like they quickly wrote it into existence. Biography of Queen Baron Zaya, Volume 3. Baron Zaya was welcomed kindly by Emperor Tyra Septim and his family, who treated her like a daughter during her stay in the newly built Imperial City. After several happy months there learning her duties as the regent under the Emperor Empire, Seamus escorted her to Mournhold, where she took up her duties as queen of her people. Under his wise guidance, gradually they became uh, they came to love with one another and were married and crowned in a splendid ceremony at which the emperor himself officiated. After se that wasn't mentioned in the other book. After several hundred years of marriage, a son, Helseth, was born to a to the royal couple amid rejoicing and prayers of the goddess who had last blessed their marriage. Although it was not known at the time, it was shortly before this blessing, uh, blessed event that the Staff of Chaos was stolen from its hiding place deep within Mournhold Binds by a clever bard known only as Nightingale. <laughs> he got himself into the fucking history books. Eight years after Helsa's birth, birth Baron Zaya bore a daughter, Morgaya, named for Seamus' mother. Oh and the royal couple's joy was complete. He, Seamus probably wanted that, that in there. Uh, alas, shortly after that, relations with the Empire mysteriously deteriorated, leading to much civil unrest in Mornholm. After fruitless inquiries and attempts to attempts at reconciliation, the desperate Baron Zaya took her young children and traveled to the Imperial City herself to sink the Emperor's ear. Seamus remained in Mournhold. During her audience with the Emperor, Baron Zaya, through her magical arts, came to realize to her horror and dismay that the so-called Emperor was an imposter, none other than the Bard Nightingale. The Bard Nightingale. The bar I just saw it. There we go. Who had stolen the Staff of Chaos. Exercising great self-control, she concealed this realization from him. That evening news came that Seamus had been killed in battle, that uh, and that Mournhold had been taken by, by the rebels. Baron Zaya knew not where to seek for help. When a knock sounded on the door, it was Edwir, King of Wayrest. An old friend of Uriel Septim and Seamus, he comforted her, pledging his friendship and, the confirm and confirmed her suspicion that the Emperor was indeed an imposter, and, not other, uh, and none other than Yegar Tharn. The Imperial Battle Mage. So Tharn was... Tharn was Nightingale all along. But isn't Nightingale, like, the product of a cursed mask? Let's look into that. Tharn had supposedly retired from public work, but, uh... Retired from public work and put his assailant, Rhea, Rhea Salim, in his stead. As it seemed, Tharn never left the Imperial City. Rhea was indeed dead, but her ghost had appeared in Edwir's dreams and revealed that the true Emperor had been kidnapped by Tharn and imprisoned in an alternate plane. Alternate plane. All there. You go. Tharn had then used the Staff of Chaos to kill her when she attempted to warn the Council of his nefarious plot. Together, Edwir and Baron Zaya plotted to gain the Impostor's confidence and unmasked him with the help of another friend of Rhea's, who was currently still in prison. I think that's the events that happened in Arena, if I'm not mistaken. But who, uh, but to whose dream she had uh, access and who possessed great, great, albeit untapped potential. Baron Zaya's charmed and befriend, charmed and befriended the fake emperor by reading his secret diary. <laughs> <laughs> with the fucking password password she learned that he had broken the staff into eight pieces i thought it was three and hidden them she managed to obtain a copy of the key to ria's friend's cell and bribed a guard to leave it within the cell as if by accident their champion whose name was unknown even to baron zaya and edwir uh edwir 
made his escape through a shifted gate Rhea had opened in a dark, rat-infested corner of the prison where the cowardly goblin guards feared to venture. So this is, must be the first dungeon that you, part, you partake as the champion. Uh, it took Baron Zaya several months to learn the hiding places of all eight pieces through snatches of overheard conversation and rare glim glimpses of the diary. Once she had a vi once she had vi the vital information, she and Edwir fled to Wayrest, where they managed to stave off sporadic efforts of Tharn's henchmen to obtain revenge. Tharn, when at where whatever else might be said of him, was no one's fool, save perhaps Baron Zaya's, and he concentrated most of his efforts in tracking down and destroying the great champion. As all now know, the brave, tireless, and fearless Nameless Champion was successful in reuniting the Staff of Chaos. With it, he destroyed Tharn and rescued the true Emperor, Uriel Septim VII, who is our homie. Uh, following the Restoration and Grand State Memorial Service was held for Seamus in the Imperial City, befitting a man who has served the Septim family as long, so long and so well. Baron Zaya and good King Edwir had become, had come to care deeply for one another and had married in the year after their flight from the Imperial City. Oh, okay. Her children remained with her and a regret, a regent, was appointed to rule Mournhold in her absence. The plan to return after Edwir's death was... She planned to return after Edwir's death he was elderly when they wed, so she knew that event, alas, could not be far off as elves reckon time. Wow. That was, uh, that was quite the read. We have the entire collection of both. We have our parchment here. I think it's time for us to stand up, not hit O, and go talk to Baron Zaya herself. It's been a long time coming. I need to turn immediately back around and I need to drink uh, Nirid wine. Because uh, as we well know um, from those books that we just read, you need to have wine breath when you go talk to these fuckers. That is a lot of information to process. For me, it was one evening's worth of reading. For all of you, several weeks, <laughs> two weeks, three weeks, I can't, I can't even fucking tell. All I know is we have read all of those, and I feel very learned now. I know much more about Queen Baron Zaya and what the fuck she was up to. I'm going to save over Dobby is free. And we're going in. We're going in. Queen, we're in your lag factory. We're here to discuss some things with you specifically okay yeah that's her husband who's still alive certainly elderly Morgaya Helseth in there but there she is Queen Baron Zaya herself isn't she as wait dark hair still I thought she had red hair in in the books huh Prince Helseth did not exaggerate your virtues. Here is the 784 gold pieces I promised. You may not know this, but not only is Gortwag the holder of that letter the Emperor lost some months ago, oh, that fucker, but he also is, is, he is also contending for the ancient relic called the Totem of Tiber Septum. You think that's what they, they were referencing? And uh, I think it was the real Baron Zaya was talking about that when the city was destroyed. Um, if that cannibal gets his warted hands on the totem, it could mean that the end of Wayrest and possibly all civilization on Iliac Bay. We may need your able services again, Kinthir. Damn. Very well done, Kinthir. Damn. We did it. We did it. You know what this means, everybody? I can upgrade my dagger fall. I can upgrade to the next version and get all those mods I've been telling you that I've been wanting to get for millions of years. And it's going to be great. Also, let me consult my books real quick. It was in like... Was it part two? 
grew like a weed transplanted. No, let's do part one. Is this all about Seamus? No, the second half. Here we go. Farewell, Baron Zaya's soldiers. Sometime after the uh, after came a day when Baron Zaya was shaken awake and nurse dressed her. Yeah, all she remembered of that dreadful time was seeing a huge shadow with burning eyes that filled the sky. Is that the totem of Tiber Septum, maybe? I guess we'll find out. We just got to keep playing and we'll find out. But, uh, yeah. If you're still here, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for watching. Thank you for sticking with me through all of reading those books. We're going to read more books in the future. I'm pooped. I finished my beer. I think I'm going to go pass out. But... I'll be here next time on the next episode. Uh, we'll probably go do some guild quests and make our way to Sentinel. Because I think we need to go talk to Queen Akatori here. Because it's pretty much the end of the month. It being Sundus the 29th. And we need to make it over to her place to do her quest next. Before the end of next season. Because we actually got a time limit in her book. In her uh, note that she sent us. But until then, thank you all for watching. And I'll catch you later. Peace.